children, grades one through six, you are dismissed to go next door to our children's church program. It's called Lighthouse with our youth minister, Akil, and his lovely wife, Megan. Any kids that happen to be left, if you're in preschool or kindergarten, uh, we do have ministries for you downstairs. You're more than welcome to take advantage of, or you can hang out with us. That's fine, too. Uh, if you haven't been around or are new, uh, you might not know that we've been uh, working through a book of the Bible called 2 Timothy, so I'd like to urge you to turn in your Bibles to the last section in that book, chapter 4. We like to teach through books of the Bible here, um, not because I'm lazy, though I have been accused of that because I'm preaching this way, but because I feel that God gives us his word in books following trains of thought that are for us to find and hear his word. So really excited to bring this uh, series to a close as we talk about what it means to say goodbye. This is a very key passage of scripture because it's one of the apostles' final uh, messages for Timothy. And as I read it and studied it, I found plenty of surprises uh, baked right in. Um, so maybe you can think of some meaningful goodbyes. Randy, I'm going to let you fly the ship on this one because you saw exactly what we did first service, and I bet you can do better than I did. Um, but remember some of those great shows and some of the famous goodbyes that they had? Remember MASH? Um, guys, I'm going to admit this was a little before my time, okay? But I, I do know that it was a good show, and, and I've seen, thanks to my uncle, a handful of episodes uh, but some interesting things about the MASH uh, series finale, uh, it was two and a half hours long. Did you know that? It was, in one sense, ahead of its time because shows since have done that double episode finale kind of thing. Um, so that was brought together, you know, the end of the Korean War. We see the, the, all the characters are saying their goodbyes. You know, I kind of set the stage for what a lot of TV shows have done since in trying to wrap things up. Uh, the next one is a little bit more my age. Remember uh, the conclusion of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Uh, all right, we've got Will here, and uh, kind of is just like is common throughout the whole series. Uh, everyone is, has their life and their vision for their life, but Will doesn't really have any plans of his own. Uh, and he learns in the finale... Uh, that Uncle Phil is going to be selling their home. And so in a really interesting turn, um, they bring in some characters from different strokes and from the Jeffersons as potential suitors to buy this home. I thought that was really creative. But it also sets a stage for how we have this longing uh, to know these characters that we've invested time getting to know, what's going to happen to them? You know, what, is their, what are their future plans? Uh, and we do this in real life too, right? Kids graduate high school, they're young and naive, and we bring them up on stage and, okay, what is your plan? Tell us, you have a plan, right? What's your plan for your life? <laughs> um, because there's something comforting about knowing that people have some sense of, of what they're doing. Another more popular one, my friend Nikki is always telling me how great this show was, and that's Friends. Uh, and Friends is a great series finale because a lot of the plots actually resolve. We see uh, two characters get back together. Uh, we see two other characters um, have some kids. I'll try not to spoil that. Um, but it did um, manage to pull in 52.5 million viewers. That's pretty impressive. That's a lot of people checking out the final episode of Friends. Uh, I wasn't the biggest Friends fan. Nikki knows this. I was more of a Seinfeld guy. Uh, I actually had someone in first service boo me for just saying that. Obviously, not, not everyone is a fan, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, but it's actually been 24 years since the final episode of Seinfeld, and if, I don't know if you remember at the time, it was kind of debated. A lot of people did not like the conclusion of Seinfeld um, because unlike most shows... Seinfeld refused to have its characters grow, refused to have them care, <laughs> refused to have uh, there be any change in development. And I actually found out in researching the conclusion that all throughout the show, the writers had a rule, no hugging. <laughs> so the characters weren't to bond, they weren't to connect with each other. Um, 
And so it was kind of an interesting way to wrap up a show. We have no idea what they're going to go on to do. They're set up to have some interesting things happen to them. But that goodbye was quite awkward. In our own relationships, though, um, saying goodbye is one, one of the greatest challenges that we have. And I don't know if you've ha uh, had the opportunity to be there when someone has passed from this life into the next. It's a humbling experience. And in God's word, this, this might be one of the closest moments that we have to listen in to someone's last words and to have an apostle of all people teaching us how to say goodbye really is a great privilege. So I'd invite you to read along with me in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and learn what was most on his heart at this conclusion of his letter. Paul writes to Timothy, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much that we can listen in to hear some of the final written words from the Apostle Paul to see what was on his mind. And we hope, Lord, that we can gracefully live our lives depending on you so that when we have the opportunity to say goodbye, that it would be rich and meaningful. I pray that you would help us to share your love with the people around us so that as we look forward to that day where we will transition from this life until the next that we can do so in confidence in you. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This is not what I expected to find at the end of this letter. Is this what you expected? I don't know. Maybe you were on the trail of this. Um, I thought that we might get more of the same from Paul as we looked at the end of this letter. You know, we, it would be totally in step with what he's written so far to talk about, you know, these big truths that we have to stand for and, and, and talk about uh, the world and, and what we can expect. That's been present all throughout the book. But as we come to the conclusion, we see that there's lots of names, hard to pronounce names, and hard to pronounce places. Why? Why is this the way that Paul wraps up this letter? I think it's a gift of grace because I think it reminds us of what we all know to be true. And that is when we come to the end, all that we have left are people. The people that we leave behind, they're the real legacy. Now, sure, at our funerals, most likely, people will get up and talk about what we believed in, talk about goofy things we said and did. But the things that really remain and hold on are the relationships, the people around us. And that's what I think Paul is doing in this passage. He's giving us the chance to zoom out a little bit. We've been zoomed in tight on his relationship with Timothy and the need for the ministry to go on. But at the end of the day, we learn a lot about people that we don't know a whole lot about otherwise. Uh, and so one of the applications we might take from this whole section is that there are no bit parts in heaven. All right? Sometimes we think that only pastors or leaders, they're like the main characters in the church, and the rest of us just have these little parts that we play. And so I love passages like this where you have to dig and search to figure out who these people even are because it reminds us that we all have a part to play. We all have a responsibility to do that part, to, to discover how God has gifted us and how we can use that gift to bless other people. Not everyone does that. And so some of these folks are brought up to be condemned. They're criticized. They've failed the test in some ways. But the truth remains that for us, we have to look at our lives and remember the people that we will leave behind and that it's the relationships and the people in our lives 
that are the greatest potential of God's movement in and among our church. And so this idea is a major theme in the New Testament, not just uh, in Paul, but all throughout. This idea of the church being a family, being a group of people called together to care for one another is one of the major themes. And so let's be people who listen to these commands, who hear God's voice reminding us that the people sitting in this room, the people that we can call to mind that belong to us as a church, they need us. We need each other. And so the Bible uses this one another phrase uh, over a hundred times to encourage us, to bring us back to that truth that even though our relationship with Jesus is personal, it's not private. Even though it's one-on-one us being devoted to Him and loving Him, the way that works out is always bound up in these relationships that we have. And so we need to work at them. We need to be reminded of our role in the relationships that we have with the people around us. I learned in studying that one-third of these one another commands deal with the church getting along. Why do you think that might be? (laughs) Are we prone not to get along? I, I think at times that can be a struggle for us. But consider some of what God tells for us as his family that we're to be about. The Bible says to be at peace with one another, not to grumble among one another to be of the same mind with one another, not to challenge or envy one another. Uh, I heard recently a pretty good definition of a friend. Some of us are, feel pretty alone in the world and we wonder how many true friends we have. This might be a good test. Who can you tell good news to and they'll actually be happy for you? On the other hand, who can you share bad news with and they're not just going to tell you how you blew it why you deserved that outcome, but they'll be there uh, in your suffering with you. With that as the litmus test, let's follow these one another commands to gently, patiently tolerate one another. And every so often, that's the best we can muster (laughs) is let's just tolerate each other. But to seek good for one another, not to repay evil for evil and not to complain against one another. There's another third of these commands that Uh, instruct us to love one another, to love one another. And this isn't, it's new but not new. And so John, for example, says, I'm writing you a command that's not new, but in a sense, it is new. To love one another, to look at the love of Jesus and allow his sacrifice, to allow the way that he put others before himself, to let that be our standard of love in the church is a radical call. And it's one that we often don't want to hear, but it's what we need. That we're to uh, be devoted to one another in love. We want the best for the people around us. 15% of these one another commands uh, stress an attitude of humility that we should uh, defer or, or put the focus and attention on other people. And so passages like Romans 12 verse 10 says to give preference to one another in honor. That we should consider what other people want in their growth and put that above even our own. This is part of what it means to be a child of God. To regard one another, as Philippians 2 says, as more important than yourselves. Not that they are, and not that it means that we have to put ourselves below everyone in our mind but to regard them, to think of them, to uh, take the time and to notice and pay attention to those around us uh, and make sure that, see to it that they're blessed, that they're loved, they're cared for. We're also called to clothe ourselves in humility toward one another. I like that word picture because sometimes we show up at church or other places and boy, we sure don't feel like acting loving. What do we do then? I like this idea of clothing ourselves or putting on the attitude of Jesus over top of ourself. Sometimes that's what we have to do is focus on our actions 
and clothe ourselves, put on Jesus' mindset, even when it's not natural or the way that we're feeling in the moment. The other one another commands don't necessarily fit into a specific category, but they're important. To bear one another's burdens, to speak the truth and not to lie to one another, to comfort one another concerning the resurrection. We have the hope of the message of life. How often do we wield that message and encourage others, comfort them, tell them what we know to be true in Christ and the hope that we can find there? We're to encourage and build up one another and finally to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Paul goes on to outline that not everyone uh, was a benefit to his ministry. He talks about Alexander. He talks about others that made life challenging for him. But he draws his strength from the presence of God. And so I encourage all of us as we stand in trials as things come into our life and uh, we feel like we're about to lose control, we feel like things aren't right, would we carry in our minds the image that Jesus is standing with us? That He stands by our side and gives us strength so that as we seek to be faithful to Him, we find His presence and His strength. In closing, I hope you remember that there are no bit parts. You have a role to play in our church, in your friend group, in your place of employment, in your family, and so play it well. Be the best character you can be. The book closes, the Lord be with your spirit, grace be with you all. And somehow, in a way, Paul has found a way to summarize the Christian message, and the Christian life with one word, grace. Maybe you've heard it so far in the service today, and it remains true for all of us. What we need is the grace and peace of God that he so freely offers. But I kind of liken it to receiving a gift. God wants to give us a gift. He wants us to be saved. He wants to bless us. He wants uh, to, be, to work in our lives. It's a gift he's longing to give us, But I think most people just kind of stand back and admire it from a distance. They say, wow, that that really looks nice. That looks great. Why don't we empty our hands and receive that gift of grace? So this closing song is all about that, having hands that can receive God's love. If you've never received that for the first time, maybe you can come forward and commit your life to Jesus. If you've done that already, Praise, serve him, lift your hands in worship to acknowledge his greatness. But as we stand and sing together, please feel welcome to come. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh Spirit, come make us humble. Turn our eyes from evil things. O Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure generation that seeks, that seeks your face, O God of Jacob. O God, let us be a generation that seeks, that seeks your face, O God of Jacob. We bow our hearts, we bend our Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh, Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us your hearts, let us not.
Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this reminder of your grace. Thank you for uh, the relationships that you have given to us, entrusted us. I pray that we would use those, Lord, and realize that these days, these moments that we have are gifts. And I thank you for the great things that you can do through these small little gifts as we offer them back to you. As some of us, Lord, transition to uh, a time of fellowship, I pray that you would bless the food that we partake in. We thank you for uh, the fellowship that we'll have and pray that your love might reach out to some uh, who need the encouragement today. Please receive the benediction. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have made known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have a great week. You are dismissed.